this is a hard time to work out exactly what we're missing most during this period of enforced lockdown. And perhaps that'll all change during the weeks and months that lie ahead. But I suspect there are many of you, like me, who love Monte Bailey, Tuscany and who are feeling the pain of absence. Missing that glorious landscape of the Val d'Orce as viewed from atop the Monte Verde, literally the green hill or the green mountain. And then there's Giancarlo's fantastic cuisine and cooking school. And alas, there'll be no concerts in the little church, at least not for the time being. You know, the odd thing is that Claudio Monteverdi himself underwent lockdown and self-isolation for a whole year and a half when he was 63. That was when plague hit Venice in 1630, carrying off an estimated 50,000 souls, a third of the city's population. Venice's enormous wealth and prosperity was built on its success in trade and shipping. At the time, doctors and scientists were unable to trace the cause of the plague back to the very ships that were bringing in all those riches to the city. Yet it was these same ships that were carrying the plague in the form of rats and fleas. Monteverdi was extremely lucky, as were his two sons, to escape the plague. And ironically, it was one of his oldest friends, Alessandro Strigio, who may have been one of the carriers of the deadly virus. Strigio had been a staunch collaborator of Monteverdi's for over 40 years, ever since the two of them had been in the service of the Gonzaga family in Mantua. And now Strigio came to Venice as the Mantuan ambassador to plead for military help and money from the Doge and Senate to protect Mantua from being ransacked by Habsburg imperial troops. And he failed. Mantua was completely sacked. Strigio was probably already infected when he arrived in Venice and we don't know exactly whether the two friends met one last time before Strigio got seriously ill and died there in June 1630. This was just before the epidemic reached its peak. It was he who had provided the libretto for Monteverdi's first extended piece of music theatre, Orfeo, first given in Mantua 23 years earlier, back in 1607. And although it was called a fable in music and not an opera, really it was this work that marked the true birth of opera as we know it. An astonishing achievement by Monteverdi at his very first attempt, coming from someone known up to then as a composer of madrigals, those little miniatures composed for a consort of five singers and lasting just four or five minutes. Orfeo, on the other hand, is a two-hour work crammed with heart-rending music, held together by its gripping narrative and by Monteverdi's instinct for creating a strong overall musical structure. It's this work that set him on the course to international fame and renown as the foremost musician of his day, Il Divino Claudio, as he was called at the time. And I've been under the spell of his music ever since I was first introduced to it when I was a boy of eight by the lady who much later became my future music teacher, Nadia Boulanger. Okay, so what's so special about the music of the man in the portrait behind me? To me, it's, it's humanity, the way Monteverdi manages to get right under our skin and capture our many moods. Love, anger, tenderness, regret, remorse, they're all there in his music. It's colorful, it's exciting, and it's always dramatic. And it's both psychologically astute and also incredibly beautiful. And no matter whether he is composing for the church, a princely salon, or the theatre, Monteverdi's music simply pulsates with life and truthfulness, and it's fueled by his conviction that music, like poetry and painting, should hold up a mirror to nature. He was one of a small group of artists, philosophers, scientists and writers born in the 1560s or 70s who were all game changers in their particular speciality. It was a generation that included Shakespeare, Bacon, Galileo, Kepler, Caravaggio and Rubens. Every one of them a bold and radical innovator and after them the world would never be the same again. When the plague broke out in the summer of 1630 Monteverdi had for the past 27 years been maestro di cappella of the great Basilica of St. Mark's in Venice. This was recognised as the top job for a musician anywhere in Europe at the time. And he was in charge of the largest choir and instrumental ensemble in all of Italy. 
it brought him the security and the pay he'd never had previously, not in Cremona, where he was born, nor in Mantua, and it brought him prestige. I find it fascinating that during this period, he decided to become a priest. And having taken on holy orders, he made a solemn vow that if he was spared, he would make the pilgrimage to Loreto. Well, we don't know for sure or when he carried this out. What we do know is that Motivelli took centre stage in the musical celebrations that marked the ending of the plague in November 1631, when a solemn mass of thanksgiving took place in the basilica. And once again, we can picture the grand procession of all the clerics, senators, canons and musicians at the conclusion of mass as they led out of the basilica through the great piazza and headed towards the Dogana, the site of what was to become a glorious new Venetian landmark, the Church of Santa Maria della Salute, which dominates the mouth of the Grand Canal to this day. And although the new church was by no means completed, another solemn mass was sung there, during which the singing of the Gloria and Credo, we are told by a contemporary eyewitness, Signor Claudio Monteverdi, the Maestro di Capella and the glory of our age, combined the singing with trombe squarciate, with exquisite and marvellous harmony. Now, musicologists have been arguing for years about which of Monteverdi's published works could have been played on this occasion in this sonic extravaganza, and about the exact meaning of trombe squarciate. Were they a special type of trumpet capable of loud, ferocious, festive interjections? Or were they simply trombones which doubled the vocal lines? As one historian of Venice puts it, Venice was not only extremely worldly, but extremely religious, and it was religious about being worldly. In the years after the plague had subsided, Venice never regained its full worldly power. In fact, its empire was now in terminal decline. On the other hand, the city very quickly regained its capacity for lively enjoyment, drawing visitors from abroad like moths to a flame. And some say it now became known as the world capital of frivolity. But I prefer to think of it as the place where opera suddenly threw its doors open to a paying public during carnival and where the septuagenarian musician Claudio Monteverdi was persuaded to come out of retirement to produce two of the most glorious operas ever composed. The Return of Ulysses, Il Ritorno d'Ulissi, and The Coronation of Popea, L'Incoronazione di Popea. And here to conclude is the final curtain music, surely one of the most beautiful love duets in the whole history of opera. Portimiro, Portigolo. Thank you. 